helping CEOs and business leaders discover the energy to perform exceptional brilliance and positively impact the lives of those around them. Be inspired by world leaders and next level gurus. This is the Active CEO Podcast, where the ordinary don't belong. And now your hosts, Craig Johns and Ben Gathercole. On this episode of the Active CEO podcast, we have the pleasure of speaking with a highly motivated, exceptionally organized, and a passionate leader. He has held senior executive roles across the globe, including managing multinational teams across North America, Asia, Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. Over the past 20 years, he has led large teams in the emerging markets banking sector with CEO and leadership roles in Citibank, Singapore, Taiwan's China Trust Commercial Bank, Standard Chartered Bank in Singapore, and his current role at KBZ Bank in Myanmar. Awarded Global Retail Banker of the Year in 2008, he has also held senior roles in well-respected companies such as GLH Hotels, PepsiCo, Procter & Gamble, and Asia Foods Limited. Not only is he a driven leader, He is the epitome of resilience and is inspired to take on the world's toughest endurance challenges to raise funds for a very important charity. I would like to introduce and welcome you to our guest, Mike Denoma. Mike, welcome to the show. Well, thanks a lot. Great to be on your program. All right, so we've uh, got you in the middle of a 10-hour run, which we'll talk about a little bit about later on. So we'll kick it off with uh, your first dive into the business world took you to the Amazon forest. Enlighten us on that experience and the reason why your chairman decided to build a power plant in such a unique place. Well, I was, uh, I had, uh, when I got, a, I was, got an undergraduate degree in history, didn't think I was really going to go into business and um, I deferred my admission to law school and business school and uh, I got a job in sales for P&G and then I decided to reactivate my admission to business school at Wharton Business School and uh, really not pursue the law degree. And then that summer, in between the first and second year of uh, business school, I was at Procter & Gamble in the brand um, section. But I had written a letter to uh, a billionaire, the organization um, called – the man was called Daniel Ludwig. He was the uh, world's richest man that followed Howard Hughes. So it was Howard Hughes and then, then Daniel Ludwig. And he was um, a visionary and he, he was the first guy into um, oil tankers. Um, I think in the first guy out as well. So what he had was a project. He predicted a worldwide pulp shortage. And so he designed a uh, project in Brazil, three, three million hectares. It's the size of the state of Connecticut in the United States in the middle of the Amazon jungle. And he, he decided to plant a very fast growing pulp species called Malina and eucalyptus. And he built a power plant and a sawmill in Japan and dragged these a power plant sawmill across the oceans, up the Amazon River, up the Jari River, and he docked them um, on this plant, the two million acres. So I thought, this guy has a uh, cojones you wheel around in a wheelbarrow. So I thought, uh, That's pretty much what I we should. were just looking at each other going, wow, what a story yeah. even to start with. Yeah, so I thought, well, I'll write him a letter and, uh, and see if I can uh, get a job down there after business school. So what I did was I... Uh, I, I researched the challenges they had. One of the challenges they had is they were um, they were burning the native forest in order to grow the um, these melania trees. And I thought rather than grow the burn the forest, I did some investigation with the FAO from the UN and things like that, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and I figured out a way that he could actually market these hardwoods in end use species categories rather than by species. So, in in most countries. Uh, Wood is sold by species, oak or pine, um, because the dominant species in a lot of uh, acreage around the world, dominant species might be 30% of the trees, 40, 50%. But in the Amazon, there's no species that holds more than 1% um, of the population of the trees. So um, so we did categorize them into end-use categories um, for railroad ties and different things. And I sent this down just to get an interview. And what he did is, um, I remember I called home um, – my parents were living in uh, New Jersey and uh, in Princeton. I called him. One of my brothers answered the phone. He said, you got a telex from the Amazon. They want you to come on down. I said, yeah, right. I said, put mom on. So my mother got on. He said, yeah, you got some weird telex from the Amazon. I said, okay. And it was the, um, the project saying, 
come on down now. So I had to go to the dean of uh, Wharton Business School, and uh, I said, look, I have to ask for leave of absence. He said, well, we only give them for a death in the family or extraordinary circumstances. So I explained the project, and um, he said, okay, that's, that's extraordinary. You can go. So he gave me, <laughs> so he gave, he gave me leave, of, leave of absence, and I flew down to this project, and you fly down to Jari at the mouth of the – Amazon River, and then you get in a plane and you fly for four hours over nothing but a sea of green jungle. And then out in the middle of this, sort of four hours away, is this giant project. Um, and um, the only way in was by plane or by, by boat. Um, so it was great. So I worked on that project, and I remember the, the most interesting um, part of that project was, was asking um, the question, I said, why did why did you do this? Why? What made you drive, try all these different things? And uh, the answer was, um, he said, ambition. And I said, ambition. He said, yeah. He goes, the spark that makes you challenge your destiny at any point in your life. And I thought, wow, that is a great quote. All right. So the spark that makes you challenge your destiny at any point in your life. What really challenged your trajectory? And then um, he said, and he, then he said, you know, the, the hardest thing that I said, no, he says, he said, as you get older from having that ambition, curl up and die. And he just put up with things. So. so that was my first sort of entree into the business world. And before that entree, I thought that the business world was like altitude. And you got, to, in a sense, you just went up and it got more and more complex and more and more complex, right? More gears, more wires, more everything else and the complexity would go out. And I realized that it's more like a plane going through the clouds. You pop up there. There's not a lot up there, really. Yeah, but, uh, but yeah it's, it's much different than you think. That it's. Uh, and and uh, Mike, would you consider him as one of your first mentors and, and somebody that really helped you get, get a leg up into the business world? Well, I don't know if he's a mentor, but the experience was, was, was absolutely extraordinary. Mm. Uh, and... Um, you know, I never forgot the quote. And that quote is that when you look at your life, what is the spark that's going to challenge the trajectory you're on? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty, it's a fascinating, I think, concept. It's a great question. And I think there's another really good lesson there in that, in that first section where you took the initiative to write a letter. And, you know, how many people would do that while they're studying? And, you know, it, it just gives you a great opportunity. It shows initiative and leaders really respond to that. So I think, you know, you're very mm -hmm. smart when you're at Wharton Business School to make that decision to contact this, you know, very, you know extraordinaire billionaire who's doing some amazing stuff in the Amazon. So Mike, could oh, I yeah. also, also ask you just something a little bit different? Have you had anyone write you a letter and it's something that you've responded to as a leader? Well, maybe nobody sends any letters anymore, but, uh, you know, yeah, you get emails and you, people ask for you know, support or others, but, or it's probably easier when you see someone in the organization and you, uh, you know, you, you can mentor them or, uh, give them this, you know, help them along. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a, it's a terrific, uh, it was a terrific experience and it's one of those things you, you know, that you pay forward, right? You need to respond in kind, right? So, so you were fortunate to work with major global brands such as PepsiCo and Potter and Gamble early in your career. What lessons did you learn in these roles that have stayed with you your entire career? Well, Potter and Gamble is a stunning company in discipline, right? So they're terrific. And uh, the one thing that um, Potter and Gamble is Potter and Gamble is a written culture. Okay, so everything is in a memo, um, which is which is really powerful because you can't. You really can't miss anything. There's no bullshitting in a memo, right? So if it's not there, it looks pretty skimpy. Um, and, uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the Parker and Gamble sort of even have a memo on this is, and I think it, it's quite profound, is that we write to decide, not to describe, which is really interesting. So, And what you find out is when you do start trying to write something, people say, ah, the business plan's in my head. Uh, really? Why don't you just write down what's in your head there? And you find out there's not much in your head. So the, the act of writing actually forces you to uh, be creative, to be insightful, to to think through alternatives, to make judgments, um, and support your support your arguments. So that was a that was a great 
sort of experience. Um, and they were always generally a market leader. Um, so the, the power of a Procter & Gamble is in the discipline, the written discipline, the, the logic that's necessary. The disadvantage of a written culture with that type of empirical support is that it's, um, it's hard to move quickly. So if you've spent months writing a document on why something is correct to do, it's pretty hard to change direction if things change, right? Yes. So, yeah. so that's the disadvantage. Now, Pepsi, on the other hand, uh, completely different culture. So I started practicing, I went to Pepsi. Pepsi is a complete presentation culture. Now, the difficulty with presentations are you can leave the volume, you can leave the impression of volumes left unsaid. <laughs> Actually, you don't know, you don't have a clue. You're just acting like you know what you're talking about. But, um, but by the same token, what Pepsi does, which is quite stunning, is that, which I've really learned from, is that when things change, you change. You, you, you don't carry on. So a presentation culture is extraordinarily responsive and agile. So would you, would you describe something like PepsiCo as a reactive organization? No, no, it's not reactive at all. What it is, it's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a very agile organization. Right? So uh, P&G is, is more, uh, I guess you would say, more deliberate. Um, and, and, and too much deliberateness becomes ponderous, if that makes sense. Um, too much... Agility it could be frivolous, you know, and, and, you, and, you, and you don't move. But I think Pepsi, uh, at least for uh, – I, I loved what I – my experience at Procter & Gamble. I was there three different times, so uh, I thought it was excellent. But um, I thought Pepsi, because Pepsi was an attacker in most of the countries in the world outside of um, the United States. And when you're an attacker, you have to be agile. You really do have to be agile. Um, so – yeah, I thought that was that was good. And plus, well, I had a really great boss at Pepsi. He had some hilarious sort of uh, things for me. So one of them was I remember my first performance review, and um, he calls me in, and I and I thought I did a great job. You know, so um, I was in there preening, sort of. And, Ooh, great a performance review! And uh, <laughs> he said, uh, he goes, he goes, he goes. I I have to tell you, Mike. I'm not dissatisfied with your performance, he said, but I'm unsatisfied with it. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, bloody hell. But it, but it was brilliant, actually. It was a brilliant concept because, you know, for somebody like me, then you think, okay, fine, I can I can do better, you know, in a sense. But it also it's a quite it's, – it's very insightful into human nature, right, to say, it, you know – because dissatisfaction, if you're dissatisfied, it's quite a, maybe it's a combative sort of thing, right? Everybody's defensive, but it's pretty hard to argue that somebody's unsatisfied. And, and is that something that you've taken forward in your performance reviews with your key stuff? Yeah, I mean, I don't use those words in particular, but yeah. But yeah. yeah, what you do is you just, you say, well, I'll tell you what, if most employees, if you say, how would you rate your performance, they'd be much tougher on themselves than you would be. Yeah. There's a, there's a rare oddity, but they don't last very long. He also had a, this, this another funny sort of thing. So he goes, he calls me one day. He goes, uh, he goes. So who is the real jerk, the real goofball on this floor? And I said, oh, let's see. Uh, oh, I, I think so and so. He goes, absolutely right. And he goes, so you know what you should do? And I said, well, he goes, you should support him. I said, I should do. It. I said, Why? I said, well, you should support him. I said, okay. And I, she said. And uh, you know why? I said, no. He said, what happens if you don't know who is the jerk on the floor? I said, I don't know. He goes, it's probably you. <laughs> <laughs> See? Yeah, I, got it. I got it. So, but again, it was, it's an interesting, again it's, just, again, it's a very pragmatic and interesting insight, which is, you know, human beings are, are odd, right? So there's always going to be tensions and flashpoints and, uh, uh, and sort of issues. So, and what goes around comes around. So, you know, you need to be sensitive that it's not so black and white. There's lots of. And I lots guess, of, Mike, it's, this is a, probably a little tougher question, but you uh, spent most of your um, career now in Asia. So, are the mm -hmm. cultures a little bit different than when you started in the, you know, the American companies? Yeah, the difference is that uh, I think is that. It, well, Asian cultures are generally much more pragmatic. Mm. 
So in Western in Western companies, you know, it's it's just you have to make it like everybody like it's their idea and everybody you know what I mean. So it, 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 there's a lot of that sort of epistemological debate about everything, right? Mm-hmm. Why do we have to change? What's the reason we have to change? And, and everybody argues and argues and argues, and it can go on a long time. In Asia, it's more like, okay, we'll listen to the dude. Who knows if it'll work? If it works, we'll keep doing it. If it doesn't, we won't. <laughs> yeah. So, and, uh, it's, and now it's smart, it's faster. Craig's, Craig's a New Zealander, and I'm an Australian. How do you perceive working in those cultures? Well, I think the Australian and New Zealand culture is pretty much the same as the Western ones, where, you know, you, it's it's – it's a bit more argumentative, you know, in a sense. So, uh, so there's a lot more debate. I'm not saying debate's wrong, but um, you know, I'm just saying in Asian cultures they're pragmatic. They'll yep. they'll just you know, they'll say, okay, God, let's let's get on with it. Yep. They also tend to be less. They're more collectivist, many of them, right? So um, the uh, the and the power index distance, you know, might be quite high. So what that means is that the leader uh, is more respected, say, but the leader also owes a lot more to the team. Yeah. If that makes sense. So, um, so yeah, they, they're different. But, you know, I would say the cultures are dramatically more similar across the world than they are different, just to be clear. I mean, most people uh, – Want to have a successful life? They, everybody's got problems. Everybody's trying to save for retirement and put the kids through college and, and deal with issues. I mean, everybody's got the same suffering. Yeah, yeah so, absolutely. Uh, no, there's no, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no safe harbor from any of that for anybody. So you know, you talk a lot about agility there, and obviously, you know, working in different countries, you need to be very agile. When you moved to Taiwan, what was the reason for joining Jeffrey Ku at China Trust? Well, I think um, I worked for let's see, one, two, three. I'm on my fifth billionaire now, um, but I've also worked for you know some of the biggest multinationals in the world, right? So, um, and, and you know, in, in very senior roles, so. Uh, I think what I figured out is that um, I really enjoyed um, Procter and Gamble, and uh, I love Pepsi, and I love the culture of both those companies. And um, and then I went out to Citibank, and Citibank Asia was quite good, but Citibank, I think, uh, otherwise it was a bit more corrosive. You know, it was a very competitively corrosive sort of country company in some ways. And I think that's because they had so many smart people. The banking industry is a bit dim-witted and slow, so it's no fun beating up on dim-witted, you know, competitors. It's better to challenge the beat on the guy in the in the cubicle next to you. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and then I went off to Hutchison Mompoa and uh, worked for a great boss there. And then I started my own companies in China. But what I came to understand is that I I need to work for a company that I think has a heart and that I believe in and uh, that I think is has good and in, good intentions generally, right? I, it just can't be commercial, and it can't be cynical um, because I'm not going to waste my time. So uh, I went to Standard Chartered uh, after my startups in China. I started Ground Zero startups in China for nothing, literally nothing. Uh, I built them in. I built two national companies, um, sold them out as market leaders. So, and that was unbelievably difficult in the '90s. I have to say. I used to fly home back and forth. I had to move my family home because Hong Kong was so expensive and so was China. So, um, and I would, and let's see, how many children did I have then? I had four, I think fifth on the way. And um, I would fly back entrepreneur class, I used to call it. <laughs> every, every, every five or you know, five or six weeks. Um, but then, you know, I got everybody out of that and uh, I got uh, multinationals to buy in. Buy. But then um, I went to Santa Chartered and the uh, the head under called and said, well, you know, we've got this uh, consumer bank. We need world-class marketer, blah, 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 executive, yep, yep, yep. And I said, look, it's either Citibank, it is Standard Chartered, or HSBC. I said, look, Citibank, been there, done that. I said, HSBC. And they wanted somebody to lead the um, consumer bank globally, be the global, global head. 
but they wanted somebody who had 10 years age experience, blah, 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 all this stuff. So I said, those, it's one of those three. I said, so Citibank been there, done that. I said, HSBC, genetically incompatible. I said, they wouldn't enjoy it, neither would I. And I said, Standard Chartered, I said, I, I think that's a good bank with a good, a good heart. And I said, it'd be, it'd be great to make grandma dance. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and uh, so I went there. I was there for 10 years. And, and we made grandma dance, I got to say. I loved it. It was a fantastic culture. Um, and, um, and a real heart, I think, mainly because it's always been in places where no one else wanted to be. Um, and the, the culture was really generous and kind-hearted, um, I think, and, and enduring. And so I did that for 10 years, and um, I ran the consumer bank globally. Um, and then, you know, as things happen, you're in line for the overall CEO job, but other people get it, and, and another guy got it. He, he was a terrific guy. And um, But I thought, okay, maybe I should go off and do something else. So China Trust, I always respected as a bank. I thought it had a family orientation. It was a great competitor, and, um, and they were struggling. They were really struggling. The, the father... Um, the founder had um, Parkinson's and um, and Alzheimer's to start, and um, he'd already retired, but the, the son had gotten into legal trouble, so he was he stuck in Japan and couldn't come back to the country, and the um, and the bank was really struggling. It was dropping. It used to be number one. It was number one in all categories, and it dropped precipitously all across the board. So, so I thought, okay, and uh, I got a call, and I said, look, would you want to go in? For Morgan Stanley, private equity. Morgan Stanley had talked with the family and, um, you know, we're trying to help them. So, and they had a share position. They said, would you want to go in and be, you know, chairman and CEO of China Trust? I said, what? What do you have to do with that? And they explained. And I thought, yeah, they're worth, they're worth helping. They're worth trying to help. So, so I went in there in um, 2009 uh, at the financial crisis. We structured the U.S. business. Um, I just brought them back, right? Because they were just a great, a great, a great bank and a great culture. And the interesting thing about family-run companies or um, with these billionaire kind of guys is that if the business is in trouble or in crisis, only an outsider can generally turn it around. Because there's just too much water under the bridge, and you know it's just too, it's too difficult for anybody to change anything that's significant. So. Um, so what happens is the management wants somebody to come in because they're tired of getting beat up. Um, the family wants you to come in because they're the shareholder and they're not getting any dividends. So everybody wants you to come in, which is pretty pretty good. And then you can you can change, you can transform the institution. Yeah, but sounds, sounds like a winning position to have that. Yeah, but once once it's transformed, you have to be clear. It's the family that's the CEO. Mm. You know? So and this is what I they, they'd love people would love for you to stay. The rest of your life, but you know, I said, look, I've done what I need to do, and I said, what's the probability you would hire me in now and give me the position like this now? And they said, well, probably none. And I said, what's the probability I would even take it? I, I can tell you. I said, zero. What's the? There's no challenge in in managing it. So, so generally, I'm attracted by the challenge um, if it's a if it's a if the place has a good heart and it's it's a good company and it needs to be, it needs to take the hill. I, I, I like mobilizing thousands of people to take the hill together. Um, and I like doing that. And, I'm, and I, you know, I, I wish I could say I work, I developed it, but I was born with some of the skills that, that allow you to do that. Um, so I turned it around and then, and that was it. And that was, it was great. It was a, uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful bank. Standard Charter is a wonderful place. And, and then bank, and so is uh, so trying to trust, and I've, I'm glad to have been able to work with the teams in both of those, both of those places. So your leadership style, Mike, um, across different industries um, and across different cultures, and also with a family-owned company, do you change the way that you lead, or is it something that you just stick with and and lead from there? Well, early on, I learned that um, you. In transformation, you can't arrive with an entourage, you know. So a lot of, a lot of, and I'm not saying it's the wrong strategy. It's just not what I know how to do. So, so the way it works is if there's a new leader into a into a crisis situation, generally, um, I found out that the um, the major success factor, the key single success factor, is um, what the 
what the workforce, what the, what the team, what all the employees think the intention of the intervener is. So if they think your intention is somehow self-glorification, to become rich, to do something at their expense, there's going to be no change. And so if they think your intention is, is to help them, um, then you've got, a, you've got a great success. And so part of that is if I arrive with, you know, 10 direct reports, then those direct reports have to convince their direct reports of their intentions. And it becomes a cascade. So I don't arrive with an entourage. I will work with the teams that are there. And it's my job to gain their trust. And if they can't, I can't gain their trust, then um, it was not going to work. But I don't, I don't hire someone in and delegate for them to have to do it, if that makes sense. Yeah, it totally does. <laughs> so when you know, go back to standard, standard charter there a little bit, you, you had to, you know, obviously quite a big change there as well. What was the role of incorporating sports events like the marathon and Ironman sponsorships as part of that change? Well, part of it is that um, when you change, uh, when, you, when you transform an institution, large number of employees, what I try to do is you try to raise the level of ambition and standards at the same time. So uh, what's important is that um, the uh, that you can do both you know, simultaneously. You want to give a bit of pride, you want to give a bit of teamwork, um, but also uh, a sense of dynamism, right? So um, Iron Man was perfect. I mean, it was a perfect metaphor for what we had to do. Um, you know, and some of the quotes around Iron Man are fantastic, you know. Um, you know, as good as I think it's that uh, one of those guys who founded it in Hawaii, it's, you know, you know, swim 3.8 kilometers, you know, ride a bike for 180, run a marathon, brag the rest of your life, you know, um, kind of thing. Which is pretty cool, and then the other one was, yeah, yeah, and then the, and the other one was um, nobody cares if you finish an Ironman. Nobody cares, and there's a great quote on that, which I would always play and talk about in the um, in sort of road shows. Is that you know if, if you quit in an Ironman, most people would forgive it; they don't care, but you'll remember it for the rest of your life. Yeah, oh, you see what you do. Yeah, that's the point. So, so uh, it was just a great metaphor, and it was also so involving, and they loved it. And we called it Iron Man, but it was like a fifty meter swim. You know, it was like it was like a five k on uh, exercise bikes, and it was um, you know maybe a one or two kilometer run. But it was the, I tell you, the interesting thing was it was team. Yeah, it was never ever did we do the individual. It was always team, and you had to pass the baton, and nobody cared how they finished. They were just glad it was over. And uh, they were glad they were part of their team. Yeah, they were glad they were part of the team. So um, so that was it. So it became great spirit. And I think the, we, for the first time ever, had um, uh, all the branch managers in the world in, you know, one one or two spots. We did, uh, I think, Iron Man Jeju. We had everybody together. And uh, it was funny, the, uh, the Koreans, we bought a big Korean bank. And um, the... Um, the Koreans, you know, they're pretty. The, the the branch managers are older, and they're all smoking cigarettes and all that stuff. And all these young guys from Hong Kong and places, and the Koreans kicked everybody's butt. It was hilarious. <laughs> they're, they're tough. They're tough dudes. They were they Bit of that competitive just, streak in those boys. You think? Yeah, and they're you know, they're just tough. I mean, they're just tough. So yeah, so it was it was good, and, and you know, people still remember it because it's you know they just it's emotional, and that's why. You know, marathons are emotional. Ironmen are emotional um, because they're physical. They involve effort, and they're communal, and they're team. I mean, it's just a it's a great metaphor. I think. So, so, talking about team, like you know, it's really important for you as a leader to make sure you build the team around their strengths. And I believe you have used the Gallup Strength Finder extensively at most of the companies you've worked at. Why do you find it such a useful tool? Well, the primary reason is that it's strengths. <laughs> so it's all strengths. A lot of these tools are pseudo IQ tests, or most of them are exclusionary rather than inclusionary, right? So um, I like it because it it's strengths, you know. Period. 
So, and the second is that it really allows um, people to reassess each other. So a lot of times when you go into a company, Bill hates Fred, Fred, Fred hates Sally, Sally doesn't like Betty. Um, but a lot of times they don't like each other. It's that most people think everyone thinks the same and the same way, so that if they say something different, they just think they're a bit goofy. But, you know, once you find out that people have different strengths, you can appreciate why they're coming from the particular angle they're coming from. And in some cases, why you should be listening to them on that particular issue. So one of the most powerful ways to use it is you take the team um, and you add and you do the profile of all the strengths. And the first thing I do is I say, okay, where are the gaps? Where do, where do we have strengths that aren't even on here? Because most organizations hire in their likeness. Most executives try to hire in their likeness, uh, which is a real risk, right? So, um, so the first thing you do is say, look, we have nobody who has communication. We have nobody who has this. We have nobody who has that. So then you say, look, we got to watch out for that um, and make sure that we find somebody who has that because otherwise we'll all be looking left and the bus will be coming from the right. So, uh, so in so identifying the strengths, it's very easy then to see the weaknesses of your organization. No, just the gaps in the top team. So let's just say the uh, top team has all executing themes but no relational themes, or it has all relational themes and no thinking or strategic themes. So what you can do is you can say, okay, fine, here's what I have to do. I remember in China Trust, the the head of the consumer bank had uh, four executing themes, and the only non-executing theme was self-assurance. So all he wanted to do was execute, and he was completely convinced he was absolutely right and only wanted to execute. <laughs> so, so, now, once everybody knew that, it was fantastic. So we had a meeting talking about strategy or something. Everybody would go, now we go, no, they go, hold on, hold on. Then the meeting would another 15 minutes discussing strategies. They go, yeah, can I do it now? No, hold on. <laughs> and then after we read the strategy, finally go, okay, now. And he'd, be off like a, he'd be off like a rocket on the excuse thing, which was fantastic. And interesting thing about strength finders is that it's not really your strengths. It's just how you think. Every morning, that's how you get up. And what what people don't understand either is that your strengths are what energize you. So I don't, we don't hire anybody who doesn't take it because if you're not going to be able to use your strengths in your job, the, the job is going to be horrible for you. It will not be motivating. It will not be invigorating. If you can't use your strengths every day, it will, it will zap you and sap you, right? So, so that's why it's important. I think it's a great... Uh, it's a great tool. So in, in talking about your strengths, Mike, um, what drives you? When you wake up in the morning, what drives you? What's something that gets you out of the bed and makes you bounce into the, into the day? Well, strength-wise, I have achievers, so that means I've got a giant tapeworm I have to feed every day, you know, <laughs> do, 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 do. So, you know, I've got, I've got that unfortunate tapeworm, so... Um, so you know, that, that's one of the sort of motivations I have. Um, you know, and um, so I've got, you know, I've got a lot of energy, a lot of stamina, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also, I've got the ability to really envision a future that's dramatically different than the present. And um, I also have the ability to design, you know, successful alternative paths, quite detailed ones to, to get there. Um, and I have the skill and ability to motivate, you know, whole bunches of people to go from, you know, average to excellent. So, and I like doing it. So I like transformation. I like like vertical learning curves. I like big challenges. Um, and I like challenges that require, you know, getting 10,000 people to take one step to the left together and create an earthquake. Wow, what an incredible start to the interview with Mike Denome. He's got a fascinating career and life that he lives. We started off talking about his work with billionaire Daniel Ledwig, and it all started with writing a letter and receiving that telex from the Amazon rainforest. He took that leave of absence from Wharton Business School, and then he goes into speaking around the ambition, you know, the spark that makes you challenge your destiny at any point in your life. We then got a fascinating insight into two of the world's leading global companies in Procter & Gamble and PepsiCo. You know, we talked about Procter & Gamble having a written culture versus PepsiCo, which has a presentation culture, and the differences in the way they perform so uniquely. 
He then talked about his time in Asia where he was working with some huge banks and, and making some massive transformational change there. I, I love the fact that he utilized sporting events and tied that into both the health and wellness and a way of bringing companies together, especially at Standard Charter there where they got involved with the Singapore Marathon and Ironman events. You can really see in Mike's mind and, and the way he speaks that he's so passionate about helping other people and we got a tremendous insight into the way he does that. I love how he spoke about strengths, you know, through the Gallup Strengths Finder and especially that part where your strengths are what energize you. And we kind of finished off where he was talking about, you know, about the skills of of what makes Mike be a great leader that he is. And I loved how he finished off with, I like challenges that require 10,000 people to step to the left and create an earthquake. All right, so we're going to leave it there and we're going to come back next week with part two, which delves into a little bit more around life in Myanmar and then goes into some of his athletic achievements and, and his wonderful journeys that he takes on around the world just to make a difference for other people through charity. This is Active CEO, where the ordinary don't belong. Join the active CEO movement by visiting www.nrgtoperform.com. That's nrg2perform.com. Share this podcast on LinkedIn and be sure to tag in NRG to Perform. Leave a review on iTunes. Drop us a line with your feedback and questions and connect with us on the NRG to Perform Facebook and Instagram pages. Be sure to check out the next Active CEO podcast where the ordinary don't belong.